Prakash, Deputy Director General, Asian Development Bank. Professor Saikat Sinarai from Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Professor Selim Raihan from the University of Dhaka. Xavier Fellow, Center for Social and Economic Progress, uh, New Delhi, and Dr. Paras Karel, Research Director, Sorti Nepal. So, so good morning once again to all of you, and thanks for making it to this panel. We are very grateful for our guests from other countries to have accepted our invite to join the 13th South Asia Economic Summit. And with this, I, I welcome Chair and Co-Chair Professor Day. Uh, so I hand over the floor to Chair to, to take the session forward. Thank you, <coughs> Shabir. Uh, good morning and welcome to this third plenary session on future of regional connectivity. Well, in our previous uh, session and previous deliberation, I think one takeaway was despite geographical contiguity and a high potential for economic interaction, South Asian countries interact with each other a very small fraction of their potential. I think that was one of the I mean, takeaway I mean I got from previous sessions. And the main reason for such, I would say, regretful situation is lack of or I mean poor connectivity. I mean here I'm saying I mean connectivity when I refer connectivity it's, I mean, I'm talking in terms of broader sense and also in terms of multidimensional sense. Here, yeah, both physical connectivity underpinned by hardware infrastructure and also software connectivity. Well, when we speak of physical infrastructure or hardware infrastructure, then it relates to road, railways, air, and maritime transport. And it also includes digital connectivity and also power and other energy transmission and network. So the I mean, physical connectivity is quite broader. And when we speak of software infrastructure, software connectivity, then it relates to government policies, government institutions, those procedures, and government capacity as well as government system. So here the importance of this connectivity is primarily, I mean, traditionally we think of this reduction in trade cost. That is its major contribution. But after, I mean, in, in the context of this COVID pandemic, I mean, its importance has further underscored. And we faced this supply chain disruption. I, and here, I mean, for South Asian countries, I mean, we need to build regional supply chain and also, I mean, create some sort of regional production network. And if for this, this, the issues of connectivity is quite important. So, here, I need to discuss on the future of connectivity in South Asia region. We have very eminent speakers from South Asia and also from regional institutions, Asian Development Bank. Well, this issues of connectivity is quite broader and multidimensional, but the organizer has tried to streamline Basically, in four issues. So here we are going to 
discuss, I mean, in this session, discuss on how regional connectivity helps develop economic corridor and also promote employment in South Asian region. That is one issue we are going to discuss. And second, what is the role of inland waterways and maritime transport, as well as port infrastructure in promoting regional connectivity? That is another I mean, second issue we, we would be delving into. And the third, how digital infrastructures help promote regional connectivity. And fourth is how can we finance, as we have I mean, a representative from Asian Development Bank, so of course I mean this national agenda, how can we finance this uh, sustainable and, re and resilient uh, connectivity infrastructure. That is another issue I mean, we will be discussing over here. So with this initial remark, I invite a co-chair, Prabhide, before I request with my panelist. And, and I think I mean, maybe eight to 10 minutes would be sufficient I mean, for the panelists for the initial remarks. And first, Professor Prabhir, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Pandey, Pos, and I'll be brief. Only what I do, well, I'll do, provoking our panelists coming out with their own versions while dealing with regional connectivity. Now, I shared a paper draft. Um, I think many of you have received a copy, strengthening connectivity for post-COVID regional integration in South Asia, a strategy paper. An economist writing a strategy paper, you have to be very careful reading it because we are not a strategic analyst. But I started the paper, you know, giving a, uh, uh, some information, statistical information, and the graph, very simple one, that in the last uh, 11 years, if you look at the interregional export, it is in South Asia, it's about a $26 billion. And which country is actually contributing? You don't need to, uh, I don't need to tell you, it is in India, how much? 80%, but if you look at other seven countries, you know, how much they are contributing in volume term is simply $5 billion. That's remained static for last 11 years. So the question is, when you draw a multidimensional connectivity, Mr. Chair rightly said, and gentleman from Asian Development Bank who will be giving us, you know, very, very elaborative pictures about the connectivity master plan if the South Asian countries, you know, with the $5 billion, their contribution, which is going to be static, and there are four issues on which, one is the Nepal and Pakistan's contribution to the inter-regional trade of South Asia has declined. Afghanistan, Bhutan, and Nepal, they continue to depend for their global trade on South Asia. Other countries, they contribute come sm almost small, small in number. So kind of an unevenness in terms of distribution of trade is very much. Now, if you draw a sustainable plan like the speakers I request and the audience, which way you'd like to break this status quo? In which way you put the Bhutan, Nepal, Afghanistan, Maldives, who the country is ocean linked, the Nepal, Bang Nepal, Bhutan, and Afghanistan are land linked. How do you put them in, in the regional program, the more comprehensive manner. So this is the questions I put all of them in. And this is, I have extensively written, and I went on and uh, identifying what could be the new drivers. And the new drivers, one is, you know, the successfully, quote unquote, and the SAC Secretariat is no more the organization, you know, who's driving South Asia, right? Um, Officially, it is there, but South Asia is very much in our mind but not that SAC secretary at coming forward in running and the driving. If you follow a regional program, a regional integration, a secretariat just play a role of a driver, of, an, of, an, of a train which pulls up, right? So here the secretariat's position is at the moment in which I found is not very active and you know the reasons. Given the status quo, like you, know, you cannot change, you can do, not, cannot do much. Previous gentleman you know, who was in the trade session, 
put a droplet on our session on connectivity. <laughs> he said, do a baby steps. And uh, this word also came out from Ganeshan um, that he also suggested. So what could be the five drivers? It's doable things. You know. One is, of course, you know, regional connectivity that the gentleman said they will be speaking about. GVC participation, Mr. Chair, you said, previous session also said, production ne network. But I would rather s abstain from calling it a localizing, you know. Uh, it is called global value chain. Please don't make it a local value chain. That's, let's keep in mind, I think Dr. Ryan would be able to substantiate it. Then, of course, sustainable transportation, financing of sustainable tra transportation, the one which is there. Of course, uh, you know, cooperation, which is required very much. So these are the five drivers which I think uh, are, will be driving the regional cooperation, regional integration through connectivity. What would be the issues, you know, I drop here, the new drivers out of which, for the discussion audience in here. Look, in the BIMSTEC, which we had on 30th of March a summit, um, and the leaders took a decision that they are, they're going to implement the BIMSTEC master plan connectivity. And some of the countries in the, in the BIMSTEC, five are also member of SARC, 137 projects, $44 billion identified in BIMSTEC master plan. Some of will be invested here. So, so Mr. Prakash, uh, Mr. Mm, yeah, Manmohan Prakash ji will be able to tell us what is exactly is doing. There was a study done by ADB called SRMTS, right? You recall, you know, Pro Professor Rahmat, uh, Rahmatullah from CPD. Uh, SARC Regional Multimodal Transit Transport Study. It's 10 to 12 years old. Maybe this is a time, you know, ADB might look at it, uh, you know, revisit some of the findings. Can SARC or South Asia look at the regional con connectivity more from the point of view of an integration perspective? Can they come out with a regional plan, a regional program? It's difficult because you need a secretariat strong. But if you leave aside the secretariat with the WTO trade facilitation agreement where all the eight countries, you know, they have done huge progress and the statistics are available on the website in WTO. And then some of the countries in, in, in the region like Bangladesh taking a lead in paperless trade introduction. Uh, recall uh, before April 2020, if you have been to your respective countries and if you have been visited or if you have written that we need a certificate of origin, online submission, you know, you have been identified by your officers that you have a vested interest. But soon after COVID came in April 2021, what you found that every country is allowed to upload certificate of origin online and thereafter it's a history, it's a revolution in the trade facilitation stories. India is leading it. The country who was opposing very much, you know, on any kind of reform and trade facilitation. India has led, uh, play a major role in integrating the trade facilitation stories, you know, in, in South Asia. Now here I, uh, in, in, you know, eight points, I leave it for discussion. One is that given the scenario where we, we, we drive the regional integration through regional connectivity, one we should not forget, and the theme is that sustainable, that is electronic vehicles. Where are we? Is it a very right time to talk each other? Uh, are we in, in positions to learn from what China is doing, Japan is doing, Korea who is leading in EVs, you know? So, so climate change issues, all those need, maybe it's an, a, a, some new agenda. And I think some of them might be discussing. Port, shipping, IWT. This is one which is discussed, something some, you know, will we'll highlight. Corridors, highways, railways, motor vehicle agreement, railway agreement, SARC motor vehicle agreement, SARC railway agreement. Before 2014, you know, it was very much active. We could not do much, so BBI and traction came in. But there is an also a risk, please keep in mind, if you talk too much bilateral, too much sub-regional, in your back of your mind, you won't come forward with a regional feeling, right? Very simple, that whatever I need, I have done it through bilateral or sub-regionally. Why should I go extra for regional? So please think about it. The one which is doable, and I'm sure, you know, speakers will talk about it today, about a regional single window. Eight countries have done phenomenally well in terms of software side of debt facilitation. Mr. Chair, you, you have reminded. India is the first country to introduce 
custom single unit. It's called SWIFT. All others are in there, you know, electronic data interchange. Can we do, connect them and resolve our interoperability issues like standards, training capacity, and last but not the least, which I think which is very important, two, two points. One is kindly don't destroy the regional arrangements. SARC, SARSO, SARC University, all these are very important. You know, we need to put them on, the, on their feet. And political directions. If we don't have any political direction and guidance, we will remain with the South Asia, but our borders will be disconnected as that's happening. We'll have lots of you know, ideas, but that may not flow beyond border. So, so with that, you know, I, I stop and I, uh, I hand over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Professor Praveer. Thank you for highlighting new drivers for regional connectivity and also providing issues for discussion I mean, in this session. Now, I invite Mr. Manmohan Prakash, is DDG, Asian Development Bank. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, delegates, and good morning, the panelists. First of all, I must say that I have really enjoyed the opening session that we had yesterday. And I have also been very uh, fortunate to really look at different perspectives. And I may start a bit, little bit uh, differently. Because yesterday when I was hearing, I think we were all feeling a lot of despair and things that have not happened. But I am known as an optimist. And for me, if I really look at this region, this region in the last 50 to 75 years of our independence has actually done reasonably well in several areas. I mean, compared to the 50s and 70s, I'm sure the people are doing much better. The quality of life has improved. And there have been some good progress. Now, these, pr this progress has largely been within the national boundaries, and I think that is where this even becomes very important, that we now need to go beyond our national boundaries, and we need to go beyond the regular mindset that we have. And coming from ADB, there are two programs that I would often talk about. One is the Greater Mekong Subregion, or the GMS, which is in Southeast Asia, and the other is CARIC, the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation. I joined ADB about 20 years ago, and we started this CARIC program. And I can tell you, when I was sitting in the first CARIC meeting back in 12, 2001, 2002, the Uzbeks, Tajiks, and Turks, and all these people were fighting with their fist. But after five meetings, they were breaking bread together. So I think the important message that I'm trying to convey here is that we share common history, we share common values, we share a lot of, lot of similarities, history-wise, otherwise. But for some reason, the intra-regional trade and the trust amongst us is very minimal. We prefer to trade with Europe, USA, Japan, Korea, and maybe miles and miles and miles away, but we do not trade amongst us. As part of my, this mandate, I mean, I used to be the country director of Bangladesh for ADB, and I think many of my friends from Bangladesh would recollect the four, four and a half years I spent there. Now when I go to Maldives, I go to Nepal, I go to Bhutan, there is one single common message that is coming out post COVID-19 is that we need to be together. And we need to really develop together, live together, stay together. And it is coming after a crisis as Mr. Dave was talking about it. I think he said it led a crisis for us to upload this document isn't this very sad? It is, it is indeed very sad. And I'll share with you another personal anecdote. I was posted out of Dhaka to Manila. Manila is the headquarters of the Asian Development Bank. I thought 50% of my stuff, household stuff, can go to my home. My home is in Chandigarh and Dehradun. I said to a freight forwarder, how much would it cost for me to send a container from Dhaka to Chandigarh or Dehradun, he says $13,000. How much time will it take? Two to three months. Dhaka to Manila is $7,000. How much time? 21 days. I don't have to say anything more than the reality that is between us. When we meet, 
and I'm sure I have had several occasions to meet with my friends in Bangladesh and several of these other think tanks. What I'm really, really surprised is that even after 50 or 75 years of staying together, we are still struggling with low-hanging fruits, small fruits, and quick wins. There is a five-kilometer rail link that needs to be built between a place called Akhaura to Agartala, which will reduce the travel time from Calcutta to Agartala from 2,500 kilometers to 450 kilometers. And it has taken 51 years, 50 years plus, for us to construct that five kilometers, and it is still under construction. Isn't it a wasted opportunity? And it's not that you and I are suffering. It is the common people who are suffering. It is the common citizens who are suffering. The border trade, I mean, if you visit any of the border hearts, if you visit any of the border regions between Nepal, India, Bangladesh, India, Bhutan, India, these towns offer a huge opportunity and we have not been able to bring it in a formal market. So I think the point that I'm trying to make here is that I think we have discussed over these years, there have been several, several studies that have been done, including by ADB, World Bank, multilaterals, bilaterals, and probably own research institutions. But it is now time to put our head together and look at some of the opportunities that we can immediately catalyze on and build upon. This session is extremely important because of connectivity. I started off as a transport engineer. The high-speed rail in China is my creation. I worked on the high-speed rail, developing the high-speed rail in China. And there is one project in Bangladesh which the Honorable Prime Minister often talks about. Chittagong to Dhaka today is 320 kilometers. It takes five to six hours. There is a small town called Narayan Ganj. If you build a line from Narayan Ganj to a place called Komila, or to be fair, Laksham, the distance will become 220 kilometers, and it will take 90 minutes from Dhaka to go to Chittagong if you go by a conventional train, no high speed. Ni 90 minutes from Dhaka to Chittagong, the two major cities of Bangladesh, which can become an economic corridor. It takes me time to go to the prime minister, convince her, talk to her, and then the project gets included in the pipeline, and we start study on it. It takes another five, six years, 10 years to build it. Wherever I go, there is huge opportunity. I met the Maldivian finance minister. We talked about it. Maldives has the ability to develop a deep sea port, which can be used for bunkering and transshipment. If Maldives has a transshipment port, has a bunkering port, there is no Singapore. There is no Hong Kong. The entire trade is here. The Bay of Bengal used to be 65% of the international trade back in the 17th and 18th century. And it still is. Unfortunate part is that South Asia is not part of that trade story. Yesterday, Mr. Mustafizur Rahman was talking to me about energy trade. This region is energy surplus. When Prime Minister Abe was in Bangladesh, I talked to him and I told him, I said, this region is rich in energy. We have so much hydropower, and yet we are dependent on importing coal, oil, heavy fuel oil, gas, everything that you talk about. Why couldn't we work together to develop the hydropower resources in Nepal and Bhutan to serve the people of this region? I can count innumerable things that are possible. The entire Nepal India, Bangladesh, water transport, riverine transport is a historical transport. Chittagong was the tea port of Assam. And Mr. Vargas, B.G. Vargas, I remember telling me about 15, 20 years ago mm -hmm. that till 1947, Assam was a very, very affluent state. Affront, Assam means the greater Assam. But look at it today now. Breaking of these transportation links has really destroyed the lives of the communities in these regions. And it is time for us 
to really rebuild these connections. And in that connection, whether it is road, whether it is rail, whether it is ports, whether it is the riverine transport, or whether it is pipeline. Pipeline is not being talked about here. Pipeline is the cheapest form of transport. And there is opportunity for everybody. These projects don't need much of an investment. The inland waterway protocol between India and Bangladesh has been existing since 1971. But look at the trade. Jamna Bridge was built on the premise that the trade traffic will go from India to the northeast. Some engineer in Buet said that, oh, a container cannot go on the bridge, on the Jamna Bridge. A container weighs only 20 tons. A locomotive weighs 120 tons. 120 ton locomotive can easily go, but some engineers said 20 ton cannot go. And the last 10, 15, 20 years, 1996, ADB funded it, World Bank funded it. Containers are not moving. Logistics, we talked about logistics. Logistics is the name of the game. You look at Europe, you look at Southeast Asia, you look at Central Asia, everywhere you will find logistics terminals. We are still in the process of developing a logistics master plan. Building a network of logistic terminals, container freight stations is the job of the private sector. They will do it, but you have to create an ecosystem. You have to create the policy imperative so that the private sector can come and invest and make money out of it. Hong Kong and Singapore, the only thing they have is the port and the logistics. There is so much opportunity that exists in this region, whether it is connectivity, whether it is trade, whether it is natural resources, and whether it is production networks or supply networks. I know yesterday people were talking about these supply chains or the regional supply chains and global. Why are we debating regional and supply? 1.7 billion population of these countries is not small. By itself, it is a world in itself. And if we could just trade amongst ourselves, it could really create a lot of opportunities, job opportunities, it can create wealth, and it will also bring many of these manufacturers in this region. Now, there is another one issue which I really want to highlight, and this is about access to finance. You talked about the banking sector. You know, one thing which I'm learning is that access to finance is the biggest constraint that we have in this region. We have a young population. The largest young population of the world is in South Asia. They are hungry. They are enterprising. They want to make money. 87% of the fintech is in this region, is in this country. But they don't have access to finance without collaterals. Getting access to finance is difficult. And that is what needs to be provided for. Now, access to finance for businesses, ac access to finance for individuals, but also access to finance for building infrastructure. And this is where I again would say multilaterals come in in a judicious way. Please appraise projects properly before you invest money. Don't build white elephants. Yesterday we were talking about the cost of building a road in India versus Bangladesh. The difference is one is to five. You cross the border, it is one dollar. You go to the other side, it is five dollars. Doesn't make sense. If Bangladesh doesn't have stone, Give it stone from Bhutan, give stone from Nepal, give stone from India. Why should they go and get stone from Indonesia? It is cheaper to get cement from Indonesia in Bangladesh than to get cement from India into Bangladesh because the freight cost is so high. It takes you ever at the border crossings. Trade facilitation is the most important element of reducing the transport cost. You look at the logistics performance index of the region. The story is there. Problem is very well defined. The main thing that we really now need to get is to really find solutions and find options. ADB on its part, we are developing SASIC. In fact, you know, this SARC did not work, so we have come up with South Asia Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation, which is India, Nepal, Bhutan, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and Bangladesh, seven of the countries. 
And I'm also happy to tell Mr. Prabir that Sasek Secretariat will be located in Delhi. In fact, we are all already working on it that it should be located in Delhi. But more than Secretariat, the thing is we must really pick up these quick wins. We must invest in the right projects. We must look at the viability and build on it. And both from the perspective of the policy side as well as also from the infrastructure side of it. Before I stop, there are two more points I would I want to make. The first point is about this digital infrastructure is being talked about. Now, yes, digital infrastructure which came up has really served us well when it came to COVID-19, when it come to uh, the payment system, but this has all been reactive. Why couldn't we build a digital infrastructure that is local, that is highly secure, and that will be able to fulfill our needs? We do not have data center. Today, data is the most important element of personal information. You'll be surprised a couple of years ago, there were no data centers in the region. Now only the data centers are coming in. Keeping the digital access, the digital forward, what I mean, basically, we, we must keep us, ourselves abreast with these technologies and move in a way to create a much better opportunity both in terms of the transport, connectivity, trade, but also the financial sector. And the last thing is we must get private sector in it. Private sector has to be part of the growth story. The investment cannot come from the public sector. The solutions cannot just come from the public sector. Public sector role should be providing financing for development projects as also for providing the policy support but the private sector financing should come wherever revenue can be generated and maximizing profits and creating these regional and global value chains. So I think I would like to stop here, Chair. I, I probably could have gone on, but I think I have set up enough for food for thought for the session to proceed. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. <coughs> Thanks. Well, thank you, Mr. Prakash, for sharing your personal suffering as well as highlighting the potential areas for regional cooperation and more than that the cost of non-cooperation in the region and also you also highlighted the issues of uh, finance access to finance digital infrastructure and connectivity and also the importance of trade facilitations um, in the region. Okay. Well, I mean, thanks for highlighting I mean, all, all, all these issues. Now I move to Professor Saikat Shinnarai is from Z Calcutta, Jadapur University. Professor Rai. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and the Co-Chair. Thanks to RIS for inviting me. It's after 26 months that I'm in Delhi. We are uh, able to meet friends from South Asia physically. That's, uh, we have overcome that challenge of not meeting people. Now, uh, when we talk about connectivity, it has its root and it has been emphasized from the morning that intra-regional trade uh, holds the key uh, or is the driver of connectivity or to come out of poor inter-regional trade which is limited to 5% in South Asia, um, uh, connectivity is important and it goes without saying. Uh, a little while ago, Prabir told that within that 5% limited growth of inter-regional trade, you would see that the trade that has happened in South Asia is very lopsided ac across countries. It's very skewed. Uh, but of late, uh, taking the cue from what Mohantiji told in the morning, there are certain brighter spots, uh, and uh, that is where we should move from, where we should move on. And it is the question of connecting these markets. In, a time of, in the times of globalization, it's about connecting the markets and there lies the importance of connectivity. But 
the pandemic actually uh, it made, a, made us to realize that how should we reorganize our thoughts, how should we reorganize our deeds. And uh, we, because the pandemic uh, uh, and trade uh, had, had dis disrupted trade, it disrupted per capita GDP growth, it led to higher unemployment, disrupted occupational and workers' mobility, it increased otherwise declining poverty in incidence of poverty in South Asia, and it further widened inequality in the region, within the country inequality in the region, which was rising post-globalization. Now, that made us to think, and the goalpost that we should have with respect to connectivity is that transact like we said in the morning that tariffs should be brought down to zero. There should not be any non-tariff barriers. Let me put across to you that transaction cost to be made zero in next 10 years time. That is very important. And for that, what we need to, and we need to reduce transportation cost. And that's where connectivity lies. And Connectivity has its positive benefits towards trade, growth, employment, but it has downside risks toward poverty and inequality. Now, when we talk about connectivity, we need to talk about, as many others have highlighted, physical connectivity and e-connectivity. I'm not talking about energy connectivity here, uh, but I talk about e-connectivity. Physical connectivity would mean road, rail, air, sea, and internal waterways within countries actually we have now by now a well laid connectivity system physical connectivity system what we need to do is seamless connectivity across the border so that goods can move across the border in a seamless way there are no hassles at the border now what it can connect it not only connects the hinterland uh, of one country to the hinterland market of the other country, but even the border huts, which we have, just someone told that border huts, which we have at the borders, they also get connected. Goods can move from the hinterland to the border huts where they can get exchanged. So this connectivity we will help in facilitating exchanges. Now, we have these physical connectivity, uh, either road or rail, or but what we need to move on in 10 years time, if we have to focus on connectivity, is multimodal connectivity within the region. Right from Myanmar in the east to Afghanistan in the west, or Sri Lanka and Maldives in the south, we need to have multimodal connectivity, rail, road, sea, we can move from one mode of transport to the other mode of transport without any ha hassle, or goods can move, not passengers. I'm more interested in goods freight. Goods can move, move from uh, one mode of transport to the other mode of transport without any hassle. Now, with, without any, with minimum loss of time, what is more important if you have to move goods from one country to another, we have to reduce the loss of time that is there. Now, my main focus in this interjection is actually on e-connectivity, which is uh, digital connectivity. Uh, and the importance of digital connectivity uh, has Im increased several fold, many fold post pandemic, because uh, the modes of doing trade has actually change. It's no, we need not limit ourselves to e-commerce or software side of trade facilitation, which Prabir highlighted, but we also need to look into the digitization and digitalization of enterprises so that they are connected with the rest of the world um, by themselves. And by enterprises, I would, I would highlight on mi uh, micro small and medium enterprises. Why I uh, 
elaborated the term MSME, it's because they are heterogeneous in character. And in most of the countries, the micro sector is larger, much bigger than the rest of the MSME sector. So it is the micro which faces the most hassle in getting digitally connected with the uh, rest of the world. And that, that's where actually digitization and digitalization of these enterprises, it's important. Now, uh, uh, this, uh, why I say this, uh, we, uh, we did a recent study uh, with respect to India, though the data was dated, we took the Indian data, which was 2015 and 16, though the Indian government has uh, changed uh, the definition of MSMEs uh, of late, though the, um, uh, there is some improvement in digitization and digitalization, but much needs to be desired because unless these enterprises are themselves connected to the rest of the world, unless they're able to do their email themselves, unless they're able to see what kind of markets they face, what kind of constraints are there, what kind of uh, rules and regulations to trade are there, they will, may not be able to participate in global trade. Now, that is of importance uh, and that kind of e-connectivity uh, actually holds much key in post-pandemic, especially post-pandemic. This, uh, I don't need to highlight on logistics. Uh, experts have already told about that, what, but what I need to tell about, and that comes f out of my last point on MSME, that we need to have a good current database on what the private sector, the small scale sector they are facing, uh, which can be in the public domain, smaller surveys get done, but nothing is there in the public domain that World Bank Enterprise Survey is dated. Data on MSMEs in India, it's dated. So there needs to be a l database which tells about what are the kinds of connectivity constraints these enterprises are facing. Let me highlight to you something. Uh, three years back, I was doing, just before the pandemic, I was doing a survey uh, in uh, Mumbai on, uh, the, on the trade facilitation issue in JNPT. And they say that trucks get queued up even now today in, in uh, 2018, uh, queued up for days together and often perishable guy items get uh, destroyed. So a, a port as large as JNPT even cannot handle uh, the kind of, uh, um, uh, ki kind of um, uh, losses that we make. So I think that uh, that is very important and it is more so important, more so important for smaller enterprises. Large enterprise can still manage, but the loss, uh, if you look at from the perspective of sm smaller enterprises, and that's there for m most South Asian countries. And this issue of connectivity, uh, the last point which I need to say is calls for policy coordination between countries. Earlier, uh, as economists, we would talk about macroeconomic policy co coordination, but for regional trade to be sustainable, for um, reducing poverty, inequality, and unemployment in the region, especially post-pandemic, policy coordination with respect to connectivity. BBIN is one small example we should build up many such B B BBINs, such uh, uh, policy coordination between countries so that connectivity remains seamless in the days to come. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Professor Rai, for highlighting the importance of multimodal connectivity as well as addressing the issues of software connectivity, particularly in reducing transport cost, custom um, clearance, uh, cargo handling, as well as 
trade procedure at the border and also in, in transit. So he also highlighted the issues, connect, uh, connectivity issues for YMSEMH and also issues of private sector and more, much more importantly, I mean, he underscored the need for policy coordinations among South Asian countries in improving connectivity. Thank you, Professor Ryan. Now I move to Professor Shalim Ryan. He is Professor, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I must thank the organizers for inviting me to this very, very important conference. Uh, now, I was listening to the panelists, and actually they made my life uh, easy, so I can draw some of the points from them. Uh, to me, the fundamental question, there are two fundamental questions when you talk about connectivity. Uh, connectivity for what? I think the first, first question. Do you have the same level of understanding about this connectivity for what? I don't think so. Uh, I'm not talking about the people who are in this room. I think we have the kind of almost similar level of understanding also, or a kind of convergence in understanding. But the countries you are talking about in South Asia, do they have the convergence in understanding at wise connectivity? Uh, I think we, uh, the first session and even uh, yesterday, we talked about interregional trade, interregional investment. And I think this is something which is perceived differently uh, by countries in South Asia. Uh, and uh, we often blame that why we are not having uh, you know, deeper integration in South Asia for various reasons. But did we actually work at the country level, whether the countries are, they have the appetite for deeper integration? I think that's what we really, really need to work on. I give you one example. Uh, back in 2016, I was actually leading a team uh, uh, to conduct a study uh, between uh, uh, the study was that if there is an express courier service uh, through Benapol and Petropol, which will actually go from Dhaka to Kolkata airport, where uh, uh, many of the samples, you know that Bangladesh ready-made garments, they actually require to send many samples outside, and they also require many parts and components, you know, on a very small size through express courier service. But what happens to Dhaka airport, it becomes very clumsy and it takes a lot of time. So the idea was where the Kolkata airport, which is relatively lesser busy, can the businessmen in Bangladesh can actually, they can access the uh, Kolkata airport. Uh, but it's not via, again by flight, but just taking a truck, which has this called the radio frequency identification seals and the GPS tracker, which the truck would be sealed from Dhaka the, the, uh, or any kind of uh, you know, customs house, and then it will go straight to Kolkata via this Benapol Petropol. And we saw that actually the cost will be reduced by almost 40%. So obvious, the, the outcome was obvious that it is going to really help uh, the businessman in Bangladesh. So I remember while well, that time Pritam was here uh, this morning, and actually I was meeting many stakeholders in Delhi, in Kolkata, and even Bangladesh too. While I was having really kind of interest from the Indian stakeholders, I would say I was having kind of cold shoulder from the Bangladeshi stakeholders, and especially from the government officials, and especially from the tax officials. They were not quite sure what is going to happen, what is whether they are losing out tax revenues, where there would be some other issues. So the reason I'm saying this is that you see that the whole issue, which is extremely important, and we talked about digital connectivity, we talk about this, you know, reducing the transition costs, increasing, you know, the movement of uh, uh, trucks and uh, goods and services. But here we can see the genuine problem. I think we have not really invested much at the country level to create the level of awareness among the important stakeholders who are really key to connect the dots. Otherwise, I think, you know, we'll, we'll miss out the very important uh, aspect, especially we should not rule out the fact that there are small country fears. Many small countries in this region, especially Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, they think that, in my understanding, the trade facilitation is mostly an import facilitation rather than export facilitation. So it will increase more import rather than export. But when Dr. Probit there and other panelists, they are talking about using the value chain, using the regional value chain, and 
get her getting more and more integrated at the global level. I think uh, that kind of understanding is very much needed. And I, I'm, I'm quite, uh, in my understanding, we actually, there is a gap in, 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 in generating this kind, that kind of evidence. So that is my first point. So connecting for what? Connectivity for what? I think we need to generate more and more evidence. And we need to work with these key important stakeholders. Otherwise, I think we can actually have the master plan we can have a very big multimodal connectivity plan, but those doors will remain disconnected and unless and until these key, key important stakeholders, they become active. The second point uh, is that, to me, the very important point when you talk about connectivity, what is actually required for connectivity? I think our emphasis has been quite a lot on the infrastructure, which is extremely important, no doubt. But are we talking about the required kind of institutions? Uh, to actually make this infrastructure really helpful uh, for, you know, uh, for this connectivity. Especially the whole political economy dynamics, I think, the, which I actually mentioned a bit in the first uh, uh, question too. Now, uh, if I talk about the infrastructure, I think we probably, we are emphasizing quite a lot on the quantity of infrastructure, but hardly we talk about the quality of infrastructure. Especially if we look at many of these countries, you will see that the roads, uh, the kilometers, you know, it has increased in, in terms of kilometers, in terms of various other infrastructural development, you can see. But still, as I think, uh, as very rightly pointed out by Mr. Manamohan Prakash, that uh, the, in terms of logistic performance index, and uh, we are seriously lagging. And when we are seriously lagging about, you know, with respect to this logistic performance, uh, you know, there is a kind of disconnect, I would say, that uh, with respect to the fact that in most of these countries, the huge emphasis is on building very big infrastructure. Uh, and I think which is extremely important, no doubt. But are we actually connecting the dots where, you know, as I said, the first point was the connect connectivity for what? Are the sectors, are the important sectors who can really gain the benefit out of this integration, are they really connected to this big, big infrastructure? Here I can see what I actually wrote many times in the, you know, is what I call the in entitlement failure infrastructure. You can have a large supply of in infrastructure, but many sectors, they may not be able to actually gain out of it because it did not actually work on those connecting those sectors to the big infrastructural projects. And uh, we have many examples in Bangladesh, the leather industry is the best example, like, you know, which was supposed to be the second ready-made garments industry, but because of various uh, issues, uh, they are not really able to enjoy the many of the developments which are taking place. So I think uh, we also talked about uh, tra trade cost, transaction cost, and we also talked about non-tariff barriers, probably out of our own passion, we really want to eliminate them all, we want to see them zero. But I can tell you that, and probably many of you would agree with me that we can't make them zero. Many of them are re really legitimate, uh, you know, non-tariff measures. We have to find our ways how we can build our capacity to actually comply with many of the legitimate non-tariff barriers or measures. But at the same time, where I think the panelists, they have rightly pointed out that many of the non legitimate non-tariff measures turn out to be barriers because of very complicated procedural obstacles. I think we haven't really invested quite a lot on how to reduce those procedural obstacles, and those procedural obstacles are, are, not, are nothing but various institutional challenges. Why, for what reason, you know, despite the fact that many of the government agencies, they understand that these things should not be there because it increases the time, but why is still there? Because of various institutional and complicated challenges where, and there are very vested interests too. So I think those things need to be highlighted and need to be worked on. And as Dr. Prabhid there talked about the new agenda, I think we need to actually look at this whole regional integration issue from a new perspective. Uh, one thing which really made the ASEAN integration or the successful integration or regional integration in various parts of the world is that there was a kind of convergence of domestic policies with the regional policies. I think there was a point made by one of the panelists on the policy coordination. I think if we really want to get, see a deeper integrated regional uh, integration in South Asia and the deeper uh, connectivity, we need to work on our domestic policies too. And where I, I can see the huge divergence, 
Some countries are doing better and some countries are not. And especially with respect to FDI policy, trade policy, macro policies, different other relevant policies, when you are talking about infrastructure, we must not forget about the social infrastructure where most of these countries, they invest quite very, very low on health and education. My very final point, and I would, I'll just stop by saying that, I think that was the final point on this sustainable financing. When you are talking about this financing, uh, and especially given the fact that uh, on the SDGs and many of the infrastructural development, there is a huge emphasis on mobilizing domestic resources and relying on the domestic resources for financing many of these important projects. But at the same time, we must not forget that uh, many countries here, especially Bangladesh, if I talk on behalf of Bangladesh, they require external resources because to finance you know, many of these important uh, big projects. But I think we have some examples in front of us that if we are not really very careful in managing those external resources, especially uh, I think we have heard about white elephants, but there are some uh, gray elephants too. There are, you know, there are some good elephants too. But even though, even are we running those, are we behaving well with these good elephants? Especially there are serious issues of cost overrun, time overrun, even with those good elephants. And uh, unfortunately, with those cost overrun and time overrun of, on, on these projects, many of these good ele elephants may turn into white elephants. I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shalim Rehman. Now I move to Dr. Constantino Javier, his fellow at Center for Social and Economic Progress, Delhi. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pandey. Uh, good morning, good, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for having me here, uh, uh, Sachinji, uh, Prabir, Sabia Sachi, I think, for putting this together. It's a privilege to be part of the South Asia Economic Summit. Uh, I've been following the summit for many years, and um, while I'm under no pretension to be an economist, which I'm not, uh, and I'll leave those issues to those of you who have written, researched about them, uh, I'll interpret my mandate here today to broaden it up, and actually, uh, Professor Rehan has made my job more difficult, not easy, because he's opened it up, and I'll try to focus on the topic in terms of the future of connectivity, going a bit backwards and forward, back to the past and the future, to see what are the missing ingredients to make this vision of connectivity real and implemented. We've been talking about connectivity in many different dimensions for the last 30, 40 years in this region. For several reasons, this connectivity, cooperation, interdependence has not advanced as much as I think we all would have wished to, as much as we all have alerted to, to the costs of that lack of that vision being implemented. So while I'm also an optimist, I'll try to be a bit more realist in terms of seeing what can we learn from the past to make the future of connectivity a reality sooner rather than later. And I'd like to just focus on three key issues as political scientists and international relations, I think, uh, uh, um, Scholar, I, I like to look at three key institutions that generally come under political economy, international political economy. These days we talk a lot about geoeconomics, geostrategy. But the three ingredients that have often been at the root of the failure to implement this vision, but that could also be the pathways to now implement it, I would say are politics, institutions, and geography. So I'll focus on those three to see to what extent you know, countries in the region can make difficult but I think sustainable choices to implement the vision. And I think when I say that the vision that we all agree on, uh, when, when Professor Rahin was saying rightly, I think the different visions of connectivity, I'll come to that in a second, but I think everyone these days, all leaders in the region, have in different ways re-articulated the vision of interdependence and cooperation through this word of connectivity. And we can go back to 1985 and the founding document the charter of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, which in its preamble clearly connects South Asian integration to global interdependence. And let me quote, the preamble says, conscious that in an increasingly interdependent world, not a region, the objectives of peace, freedom, social justice, and economic prosperity are best achieved in South Asia by fostering mutual understanding, good neighborly relations, and meaningful cooperation. We could speak about connectivity again. And therefore, it's not surprising that this charter of SARC, 
lists as the first objective, 1A, of all the other objectives of SARC, and I quote, to promote the welfare of people of South Asia and to improve their quality of life. It's not about politics, it's not about security, it's not about culture, it's about welfare and quality of life and development. So therefore, I think we've now noticed that, of course, we're all disappointed, I think, with the trajectory that SARC and this larger vision, I think that transcends SARC, has taken over the last few decades. If it was up to the pure cost-benefit analysis that I think many of you have researched, written about, alerted policymakers to over the last two, three decades, if that was only a cost-benefit rational calculus, we would have achieved that by now, right? But the costs of non-cooperation are obviously huge. There's a tremendous deficit and gap. In fact, the EU has a very interesting term that has been used in, at various EU institutions, which is exactly the costs of non-cooperation. This is actually a strategy document of the European Union by which the European Union has mapped every year the costs of non-cooperation to track also the progress on cooperation. Maybe that's something also that needs to be done here more. But more than mapping the costs on welfare, I think we also need to look at what have been the factors that have impeded the implementation of this vision. And here again, I think the fundamental principles are politics, institutions, and geography, and on all those, a sense of openness. Openness in politics, openness in institutions, the two institutions and regional institutions, and I'd say also openness to the world geography. You cannot have an integrated South Asia without being open to the world, and that is becoming more and more apparent today, uh, whether it's by the involvement of the Asian Development Bank, Japan, European Union, all interested in fostering and supporting this vision of regional inter interdependence and connectivity in South Asia. So let me go briefly to the three points. Number one, openness in politics. Openness in politics, as a Prabir Day, I think Prabir Day mentioned just in the beginning, requires leadership and vision. It requires sacrifices. It requires reforms that hurt domestic groups. And without that political leadership, based on that vision, connectivity will not advance in the region. I'd say today, most leaders and all leaders in the region have embraced the term of connectivity. The question though is, are they ready and to what extent to do sacrifices at home to achieve that long-term vision? That could mean trade negotiations, that could mean uh, overcoming vested interests in cross-border connectivity groups that are interested in keeping things underdeveloped. There are various sacrifices that will have a political cost for leaders to do. That remains, for example, for many countries, finding center province or center state balances. Sometimes regions are at the forefront, border regions, to promote connectivity. Sometimes we've seen in the Indian case, certain regions and states are actually backwards, pushing backwards and not interested in connectivity. That is a balance that will have to be achieved. And on this, for example, the former chairman of RIS, uh, Ambassador Sham Saran, uh, for example, I think quite presciently in 2005 mentioned that the very dynamic of establishing cross-border economic linkages drawing up on the complementaries, complementarities that existed among different parts of our region will eventually help to overcome mutual distrust, suspicion, which prevents us from evolving a shared security perception. So economics is a way to political coordination, cooperation, and mitigating conflicts, security dilemmas, etc. That also, for example, means openness in politics, democracy, the rule of law, accountability, transparency in policies. Uh, when Mr. Prakash was mentioning the digital opportunities, for example, when we talk about digital opportunities in terms of data protection, privacy laws, they require a particular normative angle to protect citizens' rights. It's a difficult balance. There are state interests, there are private sector interests, and there are citizen interests. When we talk about privacy of our data on e-commerce and various transactions we create. So while developing data centers, for example, all these states in the region, I would say today share a certain approach to how to look at data regulation. And that is an approach based on the fundamental sense of political openness through parliamentary procedures, to consultations with different civil society actors, with different non-governmental organizations, different political parties. That is something that is written into the DNA, I think, in the first most important act factor in terms of the future interdependence. The second one is openness to institutions. Uh, I think in Pravir, they mentioned in the beginning, 
uh, with some sadness, and I think we all share it, that SARC, you know, has not done so well. It operates, but it's certainly been sidelined. Um, the question here is, what is the ideal balance between bilateral mechanisms, trilateral, quadrilateral mechanisms like BBIN, and the classic regional organizations like BIMSTEC, intergovernmental, heavy, if I may say so, member states-driven organizations, not sector-driven like BBN, a bit more flexible, and certainly not bilateral. I think that will be a challenge. The, and I think most importantly, while institutions may no longer be so central as they were, they are indispensable. They will remain a path towards interdependence. So institutions in any form will be an important pathway to interdependence. The bilateral shortcuts will not cut it in the future for many reasons, whether it's smaller states being more comfortable at the table with other states, with India in the room, but just also strengthening the bureaucracy of regional organizations, the expert-driven, technical, functionalist approach to regional cooperation that cannot be done from summit to summit by political leaders that come and go. And I think there, there'll be a huge challenge for the second challenge of, second approach of openness I get political openness, civil society openness, the members, countries, South Asian countries openness towards the idea of regional institutions as a platform to deepen regional cooperation. Last is openness to the world, the geography I was talking about. You know, again, SARC, if you look at the charter, and um, was a regional organization that didn't have much space about to, it mentions regional institutions and like-minded regional organizations in some parts of its charter. But South Asia was much more insulated in the 1980s than it is today. Today, interdependence and this vision of cooperation in the region will not happen. It hinges on extra-regional partnerships, whether with other states, countries, or multilateral organizations, for two reasons. The first one is an internal reasons. Today, if you look at policies and the approaches of Nepal or Bangladesh, even India, Sri Lanka to connectivity, they all require greater partnerships from outside. They're all reaching out to Japan, the European Union, the United States, China, a very important actor in connectivity and financing also connectivity. All these actors, the ADB, the World Bank, all these actors are being pulled into the region by states in the region. But there's also a push factor from outside. Right? Today you see many actors, as I mentioned, outside the world, outside the region, that are deeply invested in correcting the connectivity gap in South Asia. You cannot have a South Asia that is integrated without links to Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean region, the Gulf region, Central Asia, and northwards China too, right? and the Eurasian hinterland. So South Asian regional cooperation and independence as we see today depends on those linkages with inter-regional and extra-regional actors. And I think that will be a challenge because it depends. Our different countries have different assessments of what type of actors should be roped in and be supportive of connectivity strategies in South Asia and to what extent they should be roped in. There will be different preferences in Kathmandu, in Delhi, in Dhaka, in Islamabad, in Colombo, etc. And that will be a challenge, but I think, again, this will be an indispensable factor today. I'll end at that. Thank you uh, for your attention. From political economy, from geoeconomics, from the geo the strategic institutional perspective, as well as perspective from international relations. Thank you. Now I move to my colleague, Dr. Parash Karel, is research director at Saudi. Over to you, Dr. Karel. Thank you, Chair. Now um, I'll be focusing mostly on, I mean, traditional or conventional, uh, you know, uh, physical connectivity. Um, rooted in realism as well as, you know, s looking at the future. Uh, so in w whenever, you know, we discuss connectivity m in these forums, uh, two issues come up. Whether we should be focusing on connectivity because uh, we, have been, we have not been able to lower traditional trade barriers 
and connectivity could be the saving grace when we cannot move up ahead on trade liberalization. That's one point. The other approach is that, well, uh, connect, uh, you know, among trade costs, trade barriers, traditional trade barriers like tariff barriers are not that high. So connectivity uh, is important. Uh, but my, my take is that both, you know, connectivity as well as, you know, trade, uh, reduction of tra traditional trade barriers must move uh, hand in hand. Now, take the case of Nepal-Bangladesh trade. Why is trade so uh, low? Is it just because of, uh, you know, connectivity issues? Or are there traditional tariff and paratariff issues or not? So most probably both are important. And now, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, talk about connectivity in the region has, you see, become narrower over the decades. Uh, previously in conferences, at least a decade ago, we used to talk about the you know, Grand Trunk Road or Pan-Asian uh, connectivity, South Asian connectivity. Now we talk about uh, sub-regional connectivity. Now there's nothing uh, wrong with that, except that when you cannot achieve the first best, we should settle for the second or third best. Uh, we as economists know that. But we should also be cogn cognizant of what is the you know, first best. And uh, as probably they uh, pointed out, that certain regional uh, you know, institutions within SARC should also be kept intact and we should work on it further. Now, um, so far, India has been the driver of uh, you know, connectivity in initiatives in the region, in my view, uh, partly because of its size, as well as location and geography. Multiple factors are at work. Uh, India's own self-interest, efficiency, or its compulsion to connect Northeast India with the rest of India. That's one f driver. Uh, it's behind its you know, floating of BBIN and its revival of Beamsteg of late. And then there is partly a competition with uh, China too. And then I think uh, India, you know, broadly speaking, or s a section of policymakers have, uh, you know, struggled with the idea of, you know, tr transport, whether it's a leverage over landlocked neighbors or it's a means of building durable trust. You see, it could go either way. So I think l going forward, if it is used not as a leverage over landlocked countries, but as a means of building durable trust, and trust is what has been mentioned in the paper shared by Prabir Day also, that's uh, important. Now, from the landlocked country's perspective in the region, uh, I mean, what's in a name, right? Connectivity by any other name should s <laughs> smell as sweet, uh, to paraphrase Shakespeare. So it's a bilateral uh, transit arrangement or BBIN or BIMSTEC, what not. As long as landlocked countries' access to seaports in other South Asian countries, as well as trade with other countries are facilitated with these arrangements, that's fine. But the ultimate test will be in terms of cost and time associated with, say, importing a consignment from third countries, say, via Kolkata or Vishakapatnam port, to a factory located, say, in Birganj on the Nepali side, versus the same time and cost associated with a factory located in, in a comparable distance from the seaport on the Indian side. Of course, whenever there is a border, cost cannot be the same, right? But border should not exact a lot of cost. So all the final test of all these initiatives will be comparing the cost and time. You see the difference between two identically located factories in India and uh, you know, uh, Nepal from the same distance from the port should be same, accounting for some small border cost. So that should be the goal going forward. And then in connecti connectivity initiatives, uh, it's a question of, you see, things that can be done in two or three years' time may take 10 or 15 years. And that's also a cost. So uh, Nepal currently does not have access to the western uh, uh, seaport on the western coast of India. Having access to that would you know, reduce time and cost associated with trading with, say, uh, countries to the west. And that's very related uh, to Nepal's imminent graduation from LDC stasis in 2026, because at that time we'll lose certain trade preferences in the west. Trade competitiveness has to be increased. One way to do that is to reduced connectivity cost and having access to the western coast in India is important. Now, whether we achieve that through bilateral arrangement or BBIN or BIMSTEC is immaterial as well as we get that. But talking about BIMSTEC, of course, we have an eye on the western coast of India, a seaport. Now, technically, of course, that's very much part of, an, of India, but technically, that's not part of Bay of Bengal as such. So, but then, whenever we talk to the private sector or freight forwarders in my country, they say, okay, maybe BIMSTEC can help us with access to the western coast of India because that's part of, definitely part of India. So the point is, regardless of name, 
getting certain basic things right is important. Now, um, I think someone mentioned Gati Shakti, you know, in, in the earlier section, uh, session. Now that is a potentially a public good for South Asia, I think, right? It's for in, uh, India's internal connectivity, but at the end of the day, when we access uh, ports, whether in Bangladesh or uh, in India, we have to transit through India, and that could be a potential public good. But for that, we have to link our own internal policy. For example, Nepal is making a logistics policy, and ADB has provided technical assistance for that also. Our logistics policy should keep in mind these you know, regional uh, changes and what policy is taking place in other countries also. Now technology, I'll briefly touch on technology. Yes, technology has a high potential to reduce trade costs. And I think it, from the perspective of landlocked countries, technology can potentially you know, make less relevant the efficiency security trade-off. Because what is the issue in transit? For the transit providing country, whether there will be trade deflection, yes? That's what we have been hearing for a long, long, long time. Now, with all these new uh, technologies, including RFID that uh, Salim also mentioned, ultimately, this could reduce you know, this security efficiency trade-off. Uh, there's a potential uh, there. And again, with regard to e-commerce, oftentimes, whenever we talk about e-commerce, we talk about uh, you know, SMEs uh, facing lower cost in terms of uh, finding markets, advertisement, right, finding distribution channels. But at the end of the day, these SMEs trade in goods, and these goods have to cross border, right? So e-commerce will help, but at the same time, side by side, goods have to cross border, and this traditional, you know, boring connectivity issues are also very important. And MSMEs have their own special, I mean, uh, features. For example, small cargo, less than container road cargo, and these new agreements, whether BBI and MBA or other initiatives in the region, must address their particular concerns also because they have less, con less than full container load cargo and they need to consolidate and deconsolidate. That's important. Now, again, SARC has been, uh, is, in a, is in comatose in a way. And this has been blamed on bilateral relations, right? And hence the rationale for BBI and BIMSTEC. Now, I think this argument will face a real test in terms of how a subset of activities within, say, the South Asian uh, transport transit study uh, done for SARC with support of ADB in, back in 2006, how part of those initiatives mentioned there can be implemented within BBIN or uh, BIMSTEC. Because you just take a subset of those activities and then you can just implement it via BIMSTEC and BBIN. And apparently, if there is you know, you know, a problem in implementing those uh, activities, then the argument that SARC has failed just because of bilateral problems won't hold because after all the argument apparently is that there are no bilateral issues you know, under BBI and BIMSTEC and we are going ahead. Now going ahead, BIMSTEC again has been uh, touted as uh, a connectivity initiative that uh, could, if not replace SARC, at least uh, complement uh, uh, SARC. Now what is the value addition of uh, BIMSTEC over BBIN? Right? And I think here Myanmar comes into the picture. Right? Existing uh, you know, activities or connectivity initiatives and studies even done by the ADB show that there are connectivity prospects for India, Bangladesh, and Nepal through Myanmar with the rest of Southeast Asia. But for that, bringing Myanmar on board is critical. But if we even look at civil society initiatives uh, on BIMSTEC, what we see um, is that uh, we don't even see participation from civil society organizations in such uh, initiatives from uh, Myanmar. So I think getting Myanmar on board is critical if BIMSTEC is going to add value to you know, uh, connectivity initiative with, within, uh, uh, within uh, the region. And my final point is that someone mentioned China, and I think China has been mentioned only once in these last you know, uh, two days. And I would like to you know, uh, quote a philosopher, uh, an eminent economist from Bangladesh, Professor Rehman Shoban Saheb, who you know, uh, within the last two years in a conference had said that India's look east policy operates with one eye closed, the left eye closed, right? He was referring to ignoring the giant up north. And China is part of, I mean, SAC in the sense that it is an observer country. All countries have intense relationship with it and want to extend that relationship further. And even if you, I look, you look at an ADBI working paper published in 2014, it talks about certain routes that it thinks are potential uh, for connectivity, linking India, Nepal, and the rest of uh, India, Nepal, China, and uh, Central Asia. 
And I think there's a dearth of such studies. What's the harm in doing you know, such studies? I mean, if India, we can talk about India and Pakistan trading with each other, surely we can also talk about India and S South Asia getting connected with China through uh, Nepal. And for that, a lot of studies are required. And as that ADBI working paper suggests, ADB could be a facilitator and honest broker in such sex exercises. And let's begin with academic exercises first. Thank you. Thank you, Parash, for suggesting to keep our both eyes open. <laughs> now, I think I mean, we have already almost exhausted our time, uh, and it's 28, 12, 28. So I might be able to take one or two questions from floor. If there is any questions, maybe one or two questions. Okay, if there is no questions, then I, I, I don't see any, any hands raising. No, they may be hungry for the food. Okay. <laughs> then, then, then I'll conclude this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Th thank you. Yeah, I'm not going to take time, and I'm not going to summarize. Uh, discussion is very intensive. So, uh, in short, uh, you know, what I do in a half a minute, that, uh, you know, we are uh, in this session in, in 90 minutes, uh, we had a, uh, we and we, we have actually contributed several chapters. And if I may, the editor, uh, and my name should not be there as an editor, maybe you put my name in inside, uh, I will put with the speakers, you know, on the regional connectivity for regional int int uh, integrations, then I think, given my freedom, and th that I would put a Tino to write the introduction. You know, the way he put the uh, uh, the geography, the political economy, the linkages, followed by followed by several contributions on the connectivity, trade, coordination. Professor Soikot, uh, trade facilitation, mm, Paras, Selim Raihan. So we have discussed connectivity, trade facilitation, coordination, sustainable development, financing, many things, and even introduction the new members like Myanmar. You know. Myanmar is a part of SASEC. And uh, so in a way, linking uh, from all the way from, uh, from Southeast point like Myanmar to Afghanistan. So this is what you know we had a dream you know, connecting Southeast Asia with Central Asia and South Asia has a role to play. Uh, so this is, is is going to be very very challenging, you know, and we have discussed uh, with our you know, speeches some ideas. Some of are certainly out of box. The way to integrate, strengthen our integrations, and I thank all of them, and uh, for their valuable time, valuable presentations, and of course this book is going to be the forward by my chairman. Right? You will be writing the forward, <laughs> and. Certainly, I would request uh, the organizer like Sabha Sachi uh, and the team to upload in the YouTube because we have to do the digital part of it. So thank you very much uh, for all coming here and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pravi. Well, I just want to uh, uh, highlight I mean, one or two points. The first one is we need I mean, to develop some kind of shared vision for infrastructure development, I mean, for connectivity. That is, I mean, one part. We need, I mean, some shared vision. And also that vision should capture the national ambition as well as the value of regional externalities. One. And, I, and together with, I mean, it, in parallel with that vision, we can work on how we are going to manage financially, I mean, those, those I mean, identified national ambitions. And also, how we are going to govern those projects, including its maintenance, I mean, that ensures its quality. And the third, third point would be we can share the, our experience in implementations of those projects. And my final point, maybe we need to seek some support from multilateral organizations, including World Bank and ADB, I mean, to implement those identified vision. 
Okay, with this point, I thank you all, and I request you to give big hand to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do you get a group photo? Yes. So thank you, sir. Uh, before the group photo, we'll also have the small ritual that we have to felicitate our speakers. Okay. So I request chair to kindly felicitate the speakers. So uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone. I mean, uh, and and I uh, especially thank the chair and the co-chair for helping us keep the time. The next 